Well, good evening, and I'd uh, like to call to order this Planning Advisory Committee meeting for the Town of Saugeen Shores and extend a welcome to everyone in the chambers this evening. The first order of business is additions, deletions, or amendments to the agenda, and we have nothing. The next item is a declaration of pecuniary interest, and I'll remind every member of your responsibility to do so. You can do so now or when it arises on the agenda. None declared, then uh, we have a motion for the minutes. No minutes. No minutes. We have no minutes, sorry. So this evening we have three public meetings, and they're here to, uh, it's, it's, this is an opportunity for, to really just to gather from some information. There'll be no recommendations or approvals. There are three separate meetings. Uh, we'll hear a planning report, and then we'll take uh, questions or comments from the public. So our first uh, public meeting is a plan of subdivision 41. T 2017-0144, it's a zoning bylaw and a zoning bylaw amendment of the same number, Z-1917-44. It's Mystic Cove Developments Incorporated in care of Brad Pride, 212 concession 10. And I believe we'll start with Bruce. Welcome, Bruce. So, is Bruce is a county planner and he'll give the planning report and then we'll take any questions from, from uh, the public. Through you, Mayor, uh, I'd like to introduce Tessa Forte, too, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Um, she is uh, here uh, this evening. She started with the County of Bruce, and uh, she's been listening to me tell, tell everybody all day that she's Molly's replacement, or she's our new Molly, or whatever. Uh, and uh, so she, you'll get to know her and see her a lot more over the coming months and years and so on. Thanks, Bruce, and welcome, Tessa. Okay, so um, the first application that we have here, as you've mentioned, is, um, is uh, one of Mystic Cove Developments, um, and, uh, and it's uh, not far from here down Concession 10, not far away. Um, I'll kind of go through this and try to uh, provide some information along the way as I do that. Um, I'm a little bit of a rookie with the uh, slideshow and report, so I'll try to get this uh, in the right order and, and make it flow a little bit. Uh, the development proposal um, by Mystic Code Developments is to facilitate a residential plan of subdivision. Uh, the, um, there's a, a map here on my right, and there are other maps, uh, one on my left, and there's some more on the floor there that, uh, that we can get up uh, if you want to... Uh, talk about the various parts of development and so on. Uh, it consists of 30 single detached dwelling lots, uh, one block for possible future residential development, one block for uh, conservation, and one municipal street, uh, which is a crescent type street that uh, has an entrance and an exit uh, from concession 10, uh, and multiple blocks for road widening and utilities and so on. Um, there's a rezoning application, a con uh, joint application to rezone uh, the lands from planned development to residential first density, uh, second uh, uh, provision or second special provision, um, and revise the um, environmental protection lands. Uh, I can get into a little more detail about some of those issues as I go through, but uh, I'd like to give you an overview to begin with. This shows the property. Uh, that extends from Highway 21 uh, essentially down to the shoreline development near the lake. Uh, the um, western end of the property, uh, northwestern perhaps end of the property, is within uh, the um, secondary urban uh, development area, uh, I believe. Just make sure that I've got that right, but I think it is. Uh, maybe you don't call it secondary urban, do you? No. Okay, so let me let me catch up then. Um, the um, uh, Shoreline Residential, sorry. Uh, I'm mixing up another municipality with yours. And so Shoreline Residential um, designation and uh, there's some environmental hazard in the parcel as well as this being special policy area four. Um, so um, the the proposed 30 lots uh, there would be uh, serviced by municipal water uh, and uh, private septic uh, systems. Uh, the proposed uh, Street A 
is a rear, uh, is to be a, a year-round municipal road connecting from and to concession 10. Um, the site plan here shows um, the layout of the western end of the the property where the proposed subdivision lies. Um, to the very left-hand side, you can see some developed uh, residential lots along the shoreline, and then this is a new development, a greenfield development, essentially, that would be um, on um, uh, Mr. Mystic Cove Development's uh, lands. Uh, there are 30 lots on that crescent, um, and um, um, this... Uh, this plan shows what's on the map board over here to my right-hand side, um, and that is a tree retention uh, plan uh, to provide as much vegetation uh, in that area uh, as is feasible while still developing the subdivision. There was, um, and uh, the... Um, consultant for the development may want to speak to more of the details about this as he goes through, but uh, who is Ron, uh, Ron Davidson, by the way. Um, but they started out with a 31 lot plan, and due to various iterations back and forth with the Conservation Authority and so on, uh, they dropped one lot and actually increased the size of the lots somewhat, um, but are providing. Uh, a significant amount of green uh, retained woodlot on on the um, in the subdivision, uh, so that it uh, will maintain sort of that uh, wooded uh, feel and, and look in the area. The development the lots are fairly large because they are going to be serviced by uh, private septic systems. Um, municipal sewers are not close enough to f to feasibly. Uh, connect on at this point in time to municipal sewers. So the large lots, private services, is what the uh, proposal looks like at this point in time. Um, zoning amendment uh, would change the zoning from plan development to residential one, special provision two, uh, and there'll be some EP, EP and so on in that um, in that zoning amendment as well. Uh, of course, it's uh, the high-level policies for development um, speaks to develop, uh, pushing or promoting development in uh, urban areas, um, the majority of development. Uh, this would um, provide for larger lot development in, um, uh, in actually in ad adjacent to the town of uh, Port Elgin, I believe, in the shore, shoreline area. Um, in the county official plan, um, it is um, actually designated as, short, uh, sorry, the uh, county official plan uh, classifies it as primary urban communities. Um, generally speaking, primary urban communities are fully serviced. Uh, this has only one uh, service, which is water available to it. So it would develop on private septic with the potential to connect to sewer at some future time when uh, sewers become available there. Um, the Soggin Shores official plan uh, is shoreline development, or shoreline residential, environmental hazard, and special policy area four, as I had mentioned earlier. Um, zoning bylaw is plan development right now, and it would uh, be changed to the residential one, um, special provision two, and EP. Um, Town staff uh, have um, uh, seen or been circulated the application, seen the application, have recommended a number of conditions uh, of approval uh, and so on. Um, and uh, frankly, the, the, the conditions of approval are still in sort of draft form as, as we get comments in from Conservation Authority of the town and so on. So we'll be compiling those um, recommendations and so on and, and drafting um, uh, conditions for the um, uh, draft approval. The uh, Conservation Authority, as I mentioned, has been involved uh, and uh, has made some recommendations to the developer. The developer has made some changes to uh, the proposal by dropping one lot and now they have agreement with the Conservation Authority regarding the 
um, woodlands preservation plan or the tree preservation plan that's that's outlined on that drawing to my right. Um, Canada Post, of course, are looking for mailboxes, the community mailboxes, as is typical now in residential um, greenfield developments. Um, and uh, Union Gas will be looking for easements and agreements for service installation, etc. Not too much new in that regard. Um, the um, the uh, plan development zone obviously doesn't um, uh, allow for new developments, so there, there is a requirement for a zoning bylaw amendment to put the residential first density on, on the lands. Um, the construction timelines I'm not so sure of, but I think probably they're looking at not earlier than next spring or, or summer for development on the property and perhaps not even then. I haven't actually talked to the developer to know exactly what their plans are. Uh, but the the uh, tree retention plan is looking to preserve as much green space in the development as they can practically and still uh, develop the homes on those uh, lots that are planned. Um, we received a complete application for the for the op uh, for the proposal. It's been circulated to agencies and the, and uh, it it's now being brought forward tonight for uh, the beginning of what could be a um, um, public consultation process that could go on for some time or it may be relatively short depending on on the outcome of this meeting and future meetings. Um, this is the first public meeting which is an inf information meeting primarily to roll out the plan and and have everybody give everybody an opportunity to look at what's being proposed on the property uh, there won't be any decision to ask for tonight uh, that will come at some future time when we've had a chance to look at public comments and so on and and decide um, what needs to be done to deal with those if anything um, so the development proposal um, is to facilitate a residential plan of subdivision, as I mentioned, for 30 uh, single detached lots. Um, tonight's public meeting is for information purposes only uh, and is to, um, to give you an overview of what's needed to complete the application in terms of zoning uh, amendments, uh, draft approval, and obviously we're receiving some comments already from agencies related to the conditions of draft approval which will be uh, looked at and and, um, and put into conditions of approval appropriately um, and uh, we will return a subsequent meeting to make a recommendation so at this time I, I'll, th I, I'll take it back to the chair and and so on Thank you, but just before we go any further, I think you referenced, and I was reading this, I think it should be Special Policy Area 6, I believe. I think it's, if you look in our plan, I think Special Policy Area 4 is to the north of this property. But is, is it, I mean, just just check it for the, for the for, to, to correct the report. I think it is. And thanks very much, Bruce. So uh, any questions from committee for, for our Bruce County Planner? Mr. Stickney. Councillor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, one is um, where the second culvert under the Miramichi Bay Road would be approved. That's um, something that was mentioned under the SVCA discussion. Where would that be located? Probably turn it over to the developer. I didn't look uh, very uh, closely at the engineering aspects of the proposal, so um, that would be a question best posed to to the developer. I think in this case. Yeah, and I think we can deal with that. Uh, I'm sure they will be speaking after this, uh, Cheryl. So, okay, and we'll get. Well, I'll make sure we get that question. Okay. Um. Let me see where my other question is. Um, yes. One of uh, the members of the public had a question about the possibility of moving the proposed subdivision slightly east, maybe even five to ten meters, to create a more of a buffer 
Um, is that something that might be considered? Um, we can consider anything, I suppose, at this point in time. However, uh, what it would be doing, I think, is pushing it into the EP, and I'm not sure that that there's anything to be gained by by uh, doing that. Um, if if there was something in particular that that separation distance was required from the existing cottages, it would be important to hear that, I think, so that we can better understand where that's going. Could I respond? I, I think the, this person's concern was um, trying to create a buffer between um, the existing homes that are along Miramichi Bay Road and the proposed new development. So um, having a little more green space in there, uh, and they even suggested perhaps, um, if not a berm or something to, they're concerned about noise and construction and that kind of, that's what their concern was. That, that's what they saw the possible benefit being. I guess from my perspective, I'm not sure that I could support that, frankly, if you're going to give up uh, something in the environmental side to provide uh, a little bit of separation between existing neighbours and future neighbours. Um, I think noise and things are are something that we all live with as neighbours and uh, I don't know why there'd be pre preferential treatment for the existing development, to be honest. I'll go here, Councillor Mike Myatt, and then we'll go to the deputy. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And this is a question for the uh, developer, so I perhaps you, they, they may answer the questions later. So put it on the table now. Um, yeah, I think we're going to have uh, the developer speak. I'm, okay. I'm sure Brad and so, so, so I think if you've got a question for them, might, why don't we wait until they make their presentation? Oh, okay. So specific to, to the. Yeah. Uh, so if, 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 if you have anything, uh, if you have anything specific yeah. to the presentation, that, yeah, it's uh, it about the five percent parkland dedication trail okay. development. But I sure. last we'll get that. Uh, Deputy Mayor Sharpenau. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm wondering about this 30% total post-construction foresight cover, and I'm wondering where does the 30% number come from? I'm not entirely sure myself. I think I think the more the better. Actually, um, there is a 30% number that's that's uh, tossed around sometimes uh, with regard to woodland woodlands. Um, and uh, that there is um, there is a sort of an overarching um, benefit when the natural areas are at 30 percent or higher. But aside from that, especially in urban areas, I'm not sure that there's any connection necessarily between that goal of 30 percent um, tree cover or natural vegetation cover in a municipality. Um, uh, translating into an urban setting uh, because it's hard to achieve that. So are we just sort of making this up as we go along or I mean do we have some idea do we have a policy that we're implementing I mean the SBCA is pushing this 30 percent number they've obviously been you know in pretty deep consultation with the consult with the with uh, the developer for quite a while on that number I just wonder you know, are, are we, why are we going through all this? Uh, on what basis, on what policy are we implementing here? Or are we implementing any particular policy? As I said, certainly in the municipality at large, there's a goal of 30%. Um, and perhaps they feel that because the shoreline area it represents some of, some of the important uh, tree cover and natural vegetation in the area that they should preserve at least that 30 percent to maintain it throughout the municipality but but it is difficult to maintain that in an urban setting but you're saying there is a goal who set the goal uh, well there's the Ontario heritage um, guidelines um, uh, natural heritage guidelines manual that uh, is produced by the Ministry of Natural Resources uh, and in that, uh, they speak to a 30% goal for for land generally and so, sort of throughout the municipality. I just think if I may conclude, Mr. Mayor, I think it would be nice if if we're going to have these, 
these processes and we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to try to hold the developer to a number, whatever that number is. And if we're going to let the SVCA run wild with these numbers uh, and, and put all sorts of pressure on to force changes to these applications on the basis of them, they should be based on something, some policy established by this council or the county or county council or somebody. I mean, they shouldn't just be, it, it just feels like to me like this is sort of a number drawn out of a hat that we don't have a, that we don't have a policy and that we're not implementing a policy. And so I, I, I think that we have to be more clear up front about what our regs are so that people coming into this know what they are. I, um, I'm concerned about the, that process. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think we can probably get, get some clarification on it, from, perhaps from our from our own planners or from you, Bruce, if you've got some information about what the basis of that was made on. Well, again, only that the Natural Heritage Manual uh, uses 30%, okay. and and it is a guideline type of, of document. It's it, it's flexible enough so that you can have 40% in the rural area and 20% in, in the build-up areas, and that would probably be consistent with that guideline. Uh, and as I said, it's difficult to maintain that in an urban setting. It, it's something okay. I think that the Conservation Authority strives for, perhaps, in, in um, their recommendations, and, uh, but it, it's a guideline. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, by, by Deputy Mayor Hubert. Thank you. Um, and just for clarification, it, it, the questions right now are related to the planner's report. Okay. Um, one of the comments that you made in your report was that um, you used the word about there's justification for the development um, despite the fact that there's not full services in this area. Um, if you could be a little more descriptive of why you feel that there is justification for development where there isn't full services because we've had so many discussions um, here in terms of official plan discussions and other things where we, we talk about um, the desirable um, outcome is development where there are full services. So, um, you know, I, I don't believe sewers are real close to this part of town yet. Um, they're creeping out that way. Um, but I'm just, you know, if you could say something else um, about why you feel that there's justification. The second part of that is um, our... Uh, official plan says that um, development will, you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about the urban settlement area and we change the boundaries based on the best predictions for required um, residential lands over a period of time. Um, are all of these lands completely within the urban settlement boundary where they plan to build? Are all of the, the, the lot, lotted areas within that boundary that um, it was about five, six, seven years ago maybe that we redrew the lines um, to, to set up um, what we felt were the lands that were needed for residential development over the next 20 whatever years. So, um, but I just, if you could just make a, a little stronger comment about where the planning justification comes for growth when there's not full services. Thank you. Okay, and in, in um, I guess uh, to partly answer the first question, it's always desirable to have uh, the majority of your development on full services. I think I can say that and not, not be crossing any lines. Um, however, um, this is a shoreline residential area and, and it's not, strictly speaking, uh, the serviced area of Port Elgin. And so there is often some, if you want to call it, consideration given to development that is in the shoreline residential areas that they may or may not be able to connect to sewer uh, because of the distance and the cost and so on uh, involved in that, at least until such time as development comes to, to the, um, the area. So um, I think this is a, a situation like that where the sewers are at some, some distance from, from the, uh, the property and uh, so it's, it's sort of a compromise, I guess, if you'd like, uh, where they're proposing to develop on, on municipal water because it's available, uh, but on private septic, septic because municipal sewers aren't. Um, now, to, to sort of um, speak to, to this, I guess, in a somewhat different way, um, is in, in the shoreline residential area there, I believe, that... Um, there's at least some consideration of trying to maintain forest cover where there is forest cover to the extent possible and making a, a less dense or a more, 
um, I'm not sure I should use the word rural, rural but a, a, a lower density uh, developed area. Um, in the case where development is proposed to go forward on private septic, then the lot sizes do need to be larger to accommodate the, the impacts of, of that uh, wastewater um, coming from septic systems and potentially migrating off site. Uh, in those cases, there's a D54 study that looks at the impact of private septic systems on on the land and on water uh, in the area and so on and and that's been done for this development and it's been demonstrated that the lot sizes chosen will support the um, septic systems so in and of itself a septic system isn't a bad thing they work well uh, in rural areas and so on and so there's an opportunity here I guess if you if you want to look at it is for what might otherwise be um, not looked on favorably at least by planners uh, because of its low density in this particular location perhaps it is the right fit uh, it's maintaining some tree cover it's maintaining providing some large lots for a certain type of development that may be lacking in newer subdivisions and, and so on uh, and so it's providing a product into the market space, marketplace that you wouldn't ordinarily put in the fully serviced area because you're trying to maximize the number of homes connecting to the sewers. So is it the greatest thing from a planning perspective? Perhaps not, but I think it's a practical approach to developing these lands whereby at some point in time they will connect to sewers um, and uh, albeit they, they are not going to be uh, individually sustainable I don't think because the lot sizes are large and the number of connections per hundred meters or whatever to the sewer line is is uh, likely not going to bring in quite enough revenue uh, to potentially fund replacement at some future time but on the other hand it is providing a product into the marketplace it is serviceable by private septic and um, and that's what the proposal is in front of you. Thank you, Councillor Minaj. So you're going to have to caution me too, Mr. Mayor. I'm I'm asking um, respect to the planning, but I'm not so sure that it, my questions are not also directed at at uh, the applicant and the developer and and the planning authority, Ron Davidson, that's with them. But so. I'll, I'll state it and then maybe you can let me know. So I too have this this issue with the the dive in position that says there are no sewage sewers, so we're not going to build them. So we're going to have estate lots here, and we're going to we're going to be able to build big nice homes, which is Brad's um, respectfully Brad Pride's developments are are beautiful. The sewer pumping station on the 10th concession is less than 500 meters away. And I asked Brad to look at his topographical maps at the open house this afternoon, and he said somewhere, I think, rough between 10 and 20 feet difference in elevation. Less than 500 meters away and 10 to 20 feet in elevation. To me, that's a lift station. I think we could build a lift station. So I, I want to know, Mr. Mayor, if the planning department and our staff have been in discussion at all about a potential lift station and we can put full full sewers in, into the subdivision agreement. And that, that would change it. That, that could potentially change it because then, according to Mr. Davidson and the Bruce County official plan, you are required to intensify the lots. You can't have them as state lots. You have to have them smaller because you have to maximize the number of, of uh, dwellings per hectare to, to uh, meet the requirements for putting in services, full services. So I have, I have more of the services question, but that would be the first one. Well, I think, uh, you know, that's that question is probably, I mean, we can hear from the developer. I know some of those discussions have been taking place. And so I think for, for the purpose of gathering information tonight, they'll come back with some information and a recommendation on all of the, all of the questions that we hear. 
today. So, uh, so <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that you you support service uh, f full services there. That's your that was your position. As long as our uh, director of public works and engineering says that that a negotiated lift station, which we've done in other places because of these very needs, is is a feasible and financially. It, it's it's possible okay, yep. that we need to have that conversation. Well, I'm sure. That, yeah, and I can assure you that I, I know that those conversations haven't been have been taking place. So, <clears throat> well, we'll get it when we get the recommendation. So, any other committee member? If not, then I'm gonna. First of all, I'm gonna ask anybody that's interested in any of these applications tonight. There's a sign-in sheet at the back. I believe it's outside the door. Linda. Is it inside the door? Outside the door, if you want any to be uh, advised of any of the decisions or any information on these uh, three applications, please sign the sign-in sheets. So what we'll do now is we'll turn it over to anybody from the public that would like to speak to or uh, uh, to this application. Just state your name and... Uh, Good evening, uh, Council, Your Worship. Ron Davidson is my name. I am a registered professional planner. I'm a planning consultant representing uh, Brad Pride, who's with us here tonight. Brad is the owner of the property. Also tonight is uh, Brad's uh, engineer working on the project, Steve Cobain from Cobite Engineering. Um, so thank you. Bruce did a uh, thorough job in, in explaining what the proposal is. I, I'll add a few things. First of all, yeah, this afternoon we had an open house here for about uh, uh, 45 minutes, um, and uh, neighbours were, in, were invited to attend. Unfortunately, Councillor Minaj was the only person here. I shouldn't say unfortunately he was here. I just mean unfortunately that nobody else showed up, just to be clear. Um, so, yeah, in a couple minutes, uh, uh, there have been a couple questions that I can't answer, and we'll have Steve, the engineer, uh, respond to. And uh, and if there are other questions that uh, you need to hear directly from Brad Pride, uh, he can answer them as well. Um, prior to this application being filed, uh, there were uh, extensive pre-consultation discussions with the town, the county, and the Conservation Authority. And uh, it was uh, generally uh, supported, at least in principle, this, the development that uh, uh, Brad was proposing. Uh, in particular, uh, we had the Conservation Authority on site in terms of uh, the general idea of the development. They had seen the environmental impact study and uh, they wanted to see sometime through the process a tree retention plan. And that has since been done, and it's beside me here. And as you heard Bruce indicate, uh, the Conservation Authority is now on side. So that's that's wonderful from our end. Also, during pre-consultation, uh, the, the discussion certainly focused on the idea of partial servicing, so municipal water but private septic systems. And it was, uh, without putting words in town staff's mouth, um, it was supported, the idea that, uh, um, this, that these lands because of the location of uh, the only the water in the neighborhood and not the sanitary sewers, that the idea of having a septic system service each individual site would be acceptable, provided the engineering report could demonstrate that uh, the, st the lands can be accommodated on the idea, on the principle of, uh, of private septic. So the um, the engineering report was done, the nitrate study, and Bruce made reference to it. It was done in accordance with the Ministry of the Environment's uh, standards for uh, septic systems, um, and that that has been done. Um, Mr. Pride has also put forward the proposal that when, or if and when, probably more a matter of when, sanitary sewers do go by the door, so to speak, uh, that the lots within the subdivision will hook up. So he's willing to sign a development agreement that says when sanitary sewers go by, that the individual property owners will be responsible for connecting. So that kind of gets the municipality off the hook in my mind. Um, just uh, so anyway, on, the, on that understanding, we move forward with the proposal in terms of making a formal submission. The submission was accompanied by a series of reports uh, in addition to the, uh, the engineering report that took a look at uh, um, nitrate. There's also a uh, prelim preliminary stormwater management report. Uh, there was an archaeological assessment. Uh, there was a tree preservation and edge management plan. Uh, there was an environmental impact study, of course, that took a look at the impact on the, uh, on the, on the natural heritage features on the property and the surrounding lands. And then there was my planning report that uh, demonstrated that uh, the proposal represents good land use planning. 
So all that was filed. Um, a couple more things, I guess, just in terms of addressing a, a couple of things I heard here tonight. The lands are designated shoreline residential, as, as Bruce has indicated, um, and, and, and the, the actual density policies do not apply to this area. So even if these lands were serviced with uh, full municipal water and sewer, the 15 units per gross hectare policy that applies to the rest of Saugeen Shores, be those lands that are designated residential, those policies do not apply to the shoreline residential designation. And we had this discussion with the county planning department and that was made entirely clear. It's kind of a moot point because we don't have full services here, but just just the same. If if sir, because it was brought up by from Councillor Minaj, if there was full municipal servicing, we still would not necessarily have to achieve that 15 unit per net hectare uh, policy. Um, in, in my mind, uh, this this is a a, a very uh, it's a very nice development. So I heard. Uh, Councillor Minaj again say Brad Pride does good work and he, and he does. Um, given the site and the natural heritage features that exist on the property, in, in my mind this is an, is, is an appropriate balance between urban, urban development and protecting the natural environment. Um, the, the proposed partial, service to, uh, partial servicing arrangement is supported, again, by the nitrate loading study uh, in accordance with the province's D54 guidelines and it will not create a negative impact on the natural heritage features of the site or the adjacent lands. And basically you've heard that, or you will hear that when the Conservation Authority uh, uh, does provide their, their formal letters uh, signing off on this, which again, they, they basically have. Um, I think that's all I have to say. I know there have been a couple questions. Uh, Steve, do you want to, through you, Mr. Mayor, have Steve come up? Because I know there's one question that's already been asked of him. Absolutely. Good evening. Thank you for having me here. Um, I won't go through all the servicing aspects. We've touched base on the water. Um, water is being provided to the subdivision by the municipal water system. That is located just to the west at the Miramichi Bay Road intersection. Um, sanitary, sewer, or sanitary servicing, um, we've discussed, uh, it is going to be serviced with, uh, we call them, call them class four sewage systems, um, conventional. Uh, septic systems. Um, our firm, as part of the approval of the subdivision, had to do it. You've heard the the, uh, the, re the guideline, the D54 study uh, ministry puts out a guideline. If you're going to do uh, rural servicing, then um, it all comes down to how much nitrates can uh, be allowed to be put into the groundwater system underneath your property, and that limit is 10 milligrams per liter. Um, of nitrates and when we did our calculations actually we ran them based on 31 lots um, we were our nitrate calculation the th theoretical calculations was half of that uh, requirement so it was actually 4.7 milligrams per liter so the lots are big and, and can accommodate the, the on-site sewage systems um, they're designed to uh, there's uh, provincial requirements under the building code that the sewage systems we designed to uh, when we get to that point. Um, the other th um, aspect of, from an engineering perspective, is uh, stormwater, and I'll touch the base on that as part of our uh, um, documents that we support or submit it to the county as part of the uh, draft plan approval application. We were required to do a preliminary stormwater management report, and that report deals with uh, how we're going to deal with. Uh, stormwater or, or runoff from the subdivision. Um, typically, we've done a, a few down in this area of uh, Saugeen Shores, and because we're our proximity to Lake Huron, we, we can take advantage of that and discharge um, directly into the lake, as long as we do not uh, impact anyone downstream. There are a few ex existing single detached houses that are um, in between us and, and Lake Huron. But what we are proposing, there's a, there is a corridor um, between lots 9 and 10, and it's block 31. That corridor, and then it, it extends down to Miramichi Bay Road, and that will be our outlet for stormwater from the subdivision. Um, right now, that's, it's proposed that a, a two-foot diameter culvert will be installed through that uh, block, block 31, all the way down to Miramichi Bay Road. 
at Miramichi Bay Road, there is an existing um, culvert there already. Um, we are proposing to twin that culvert, and by that meaning we're putting a, an identical size culvert to the south of the existing culvert. Uh, it's a two foot diameter culvert already, so we'll have two two foot diameter culverts there. Now, that uh, the reason for twinning that existing culvert is this to take the, we have to design for uh, the worst case scenario, which is a 100 year storm, and uh, by twinning the culvert, that will be able to accommodate that well, one in 100 year storm, the worst case storm. Um, for uh, the other aspect for stormwater management is looking at the quality of water that leaves the site. Um, right now it's proposed to um, install what we call an oil grit separator. Um, that, is, that is a oversized manhole and uh, what it does is uh, removes the, the sands, the sediments, the, the pollutants that run off from, from a road. You can get oils and um, grease and, and then you get the sediments from other um, from off properties and um, all that gets into the stormwater and the requirement from the province and the Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority is that we have to remove 80% of that uh, sediment that gets into um, stormwater and we're doing that by, by again installing, installing an oil grit separator and that's going to be located just before um, block 31 and that uh, oil grit separator um, will be connected to all the internal storm sewer pipes that are going to be um, servicing the subdivision and pr providing the, the drainage from the road system. Other than that, I think I answered Councillor Grace's question. Okay. Oh, yes. Are you satisfied with that? Sure. Okay. I think uh, Mike had a question also. Maybe it could be directed at Ron or you about on parkland dedication. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And I, I had uh, actually three questions, if I might. Um, one was, um, <clears throat> before I get to the uh, trail linkages and, and parkland dedication uh, in, internally uh, with the road system, are, are we looking at um, sidewalk provision in this in this 30 house development? Or if, 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 we are at, if we're looking for sidewalks, why are we looking for sidewalks? And if we're not looking for sidewalks, why are we not looking for sidewalks? I, so I like to hear answers to both. Um, Miramichi Bay uh, Estates, I think that's the name of the development there, pardon me if I got that name wrong, but just north, um, there are no sidewalks in that development. There are a fair number of children in there, and I wonder how that's working with uh, children walking on the roads to get down to the lake. So are there provisions for sidewalks in this development, yes or no, and why both ways? That's the first question I have, so you want to make note of that one. And uh, the second question I had was in, in, in terms of the 5% parkland dedication. Lately, this uh, we've been taking the last two or three developments cash in lieu, um, rather than taking the uh, the land for a quote parkette, for example, in this area. Um, have you talked about a little parkette for this development? Are we taking? A look, are we looking at five percent uh, cash in lieu? I see a lot of green space there. Granted, I understand that, but uh, are we doing? Uh, is that is that is that been talked about the cash in lieu versus a parkette type uh, situation? And thirdly. Um, with the trail linkages east to Woodland Trail and west to Lake Huron, uh, what are the plans for provisions for trail linkages coming out of this 30, 30 house development? Okay, I can probably touch base on the first one unless Brad wants to. The sidewalks, uh, we haven't entered into that nitty gritty uh, engineering design component yet, and I, the subdivision to the north, Pegasus Trails, is uh, the one you're referring to, I'm assuming, um, and it doesn't have any sidewalks right now. But I think once we get into that, uh, definitely, definitely be some discussions on that. Well, the, the development further north, that where I think where Brad resides up in the Miramichi. Yeah, Miramichi Forest. Yes, with regards to the sidewalk, the, one of the conditions we got from the uh, uh, town as part of the negotiations was a request for putting sidewalks in. And uh, on the Pegasus Trails 10 years ago, I argued against it, um, uh, mainly because it's, you know, a small development. It wouldn't be that much in the way of pedestrian traffic. I live at the corner of Miramichi Shores, uh, which doesn't have any sidewalks either. 
And what I've noticed as that subdivision is growing, there are more and more people making their way from the subdivision down to the lakeshore. And, the, and there's a lot of young families there. So uh, initially, for when I saw the, the requirements in the town for Lakeside Woods for this development, my initial reaction was no, and then I got thinking about it a bit further, and I have personally no problems with it. I think uh, it gets people off the roads and provides uh, added uh, pedestrian linkages, so uh, it's obviously more cost, but I, I would support uh, putting sidewalks in. With regards to the 5%, um, we're still in uh, discussions with the town regarding uh, what the, the park dedication is. Uh, as a lot of you know, I'm a big supporter of trails within the, your community here, and, uh, and uh, we have uh, um, quite a few trail systems uh, right in that area there. Um, I'm planning on constructing more trails, um, and I'm hoping that the town takes that into consideration as part of my parkland dedication. Well, that uh, answers the cash and move discussion to a certain extent in the trails, but uh, there will be additional trails constructed in there. And just one final comment. I did, I did want to thank you, Brad, for all the great work you've done with trail development in this community, uh, north, south, some east, west. You've done a whole lot of trail development in Southern Shores, and I, I really do appreciate your efforts. Yeah, thank you. Okay, is there anyone... In any else in the room would like to speak to this application? I'll ask one more time. Was there anyone else would like to speak to this application? Elsa Minaj. I believe we had an engineer, and well, Brad's an engineer. So, are we just? Am I going to get any reply to my? question or is it for later that's just noted and filed for later they're going to come discuss it and come back with it later i you know about uh, the servicing you mean yeah i think that was discussed i think it was mentioned do you want to speak to it again anybody well i have i have more i have follow up all right go ahead so i had a discussion with brad actually um at the open house and he uh, agreed there had been a smell in miramichi bay this, this summer that was a very sewage related smell and, uh, his opinion so we both we all have opinions and his opinion was that it was a, an effluent plume from the Saugeen River that had uh, moved by current into Miramichi Bay and was organic material that was was potentially decomposing so I can accept that at face value it, it very well may be that it also might be <clears throat> septic system issues. So I wondered if, if I could ask that some kind of follow-up be taken to ascertain exactly what the source of, uh, was in Miramichi Bay. It's a very eco-sensitive bay, and, and uh, we are now between us and, and the local community. We've established a new local community there. Brad's got over a hundred lots in that area that, that he's working on, which is, is uh, substantial. Three, three major subdivision agreements, all adding to, to effluent into that small bay. So I understand the, the uh, Orbite group, uh, engineering group, have done the calculations for, for how much this new projected model will will add to the numbers of all the other lots that are there um, how how do we get that how do we get that double checked how do we how do we know what was causing that that uh, smell in miramichi bay Th those are my additional questions I, I, um, first of all I, you made a statement that said the effluent was going into miramichi bay and i don't think that's a fact at all don't know that for sure that any effluent's going into Miramichi Bay. In fact, I don't think there is any. I mean, properly op operating class four septic systems are as efficient as sewage treatment plants. So, but but to your, I mean, this is a separate question to this development. If there's an issue around the water quality in George in um, Miramichi Bay, then I think we can probably ask our staff to come back with some ideas about how we could find out what it, what's causing it. 
I mean, we get down there today and there's a thousand geese sitting in that bay. That may have one effect on it too. I don't know. I mean, we're speculating. We're really speculating about this. I would say I'm pretty, very confident, yes. I think what that, this is what the study does at the, at the ministry called the D54 study, will tell you, um, and these are based on some scientific facts. But I mean, the issue around the water quality, I, I, you know, if there is an issue, I think we can investigate that in some other method. So is there anyone else from the public who would like to speak to this? If not, then thank you very much. So uh, what will happen is we'll take this information and our planning department and our town staff will come back with a recommendation at some future meeting. Thank you for everyone's interest in this one. So the next item on the agenda is <clears throat> the draft plan is, is the draft plan of subdivision 41T 2017-0348, zoning bylaw amendment Z5217-48. Donald and William Leslie in care of Ron Davison and it's Deer Run Court. And again, we'll start with the planning report from our planner, Mr. Stickney.
I should be using the mic. The street will come into the uh, development of Deer Run Court uh, at the south or the bottom side of the page. Uh, the bulb at the end of Cedar Court would likely be removed and it would be a continuous street that curves up and, and connects back to Oak Street uh, at the north side. There would be lots along um, the Shore Road as well as along the Street A which is the one that's connecting from um, Deer Run Court. Uh, and also there are four lots on the east side of the new street and one in the uh, northeast corner of that block of land that are proposed. In the area that isn't uh, proposed for um, residential lots, there is an EP zone area that will or that will become EP uh, zone and it will be an EH-C. Uh, that's um, connected to a wetland or or a wet area, I should probably refer to it as, um, in the um, eastern side of that development. Okay. Okay. Okay, perfect. So, um, currently, yes, there is some EP showing on the left-hand side, the existing zoning, and then PD uh, on the north and uh, west sides of that block of land. The the development proposal you see on the right um, that shows the zoning that's proposed as well as the street layout where uh, Deer Run Court comes in and would connect to Street A which uh, is um, is curving up and, and meeting with Oak Street. Um, the, the purple area on that uh, proposed zoning map that's up uh, uh, on the uh, on the screen now uh, on the left, on the right, sorry, the right hand side of the screen, uh, that is an area where there is some wet area on the property. Uh, there would be some potential uh, issues with, um, with that area trying to develop it. Uh, first of all, it's wet. Secondly, there may be some organic soils and so on that would give some challenges for um, uh, stability of. Um, uh, foundations and, and so on and so forth. Um, just to talk a little bit more about what's proposed, the lotting you can see in this sort of, I don't know what color to call that, greenish brown or something of that uh, sort that that is in the uh, residential zone. Uh, and then you'll see that there are some, there's a red border and a green band along um, the Shore Road, for example. Uh, the green band would be an area where trees would be preserved uh, to essentially provide a buffer between the street and, and the lots themselves. Um, there is um, that red band uh, that would be um, an area where the trees could be removed to facilitate construction of new homes um, behind the vegetated screen along the road. And then of course the residential interior of the lot uh, where development could occur. Um, the two, the green band is the, um, is the um, I think it should be EP-B perhaps uh, instead of EH. Uh, it seems to be consistent with the other uh, zoning there on, on, the, uh, on the existing property. So um, in any case, those, those would be areas where um, the B would be where the, uh, the trees are preserved. The, um, the uh, A is the red line where trees could be removed to facilitate development on the property. And then there's a C which would provide drainage connections and and natural cover um, that runs down between the north and south blocks of of lots, and then um, and then the area that has the uh, wetland wet area. Um, similarly, along the north and south, along Oak Street and down along Deer Court, there would be an area that um, would also uh, have natural vegetation um, and. Um, the uh, um, the propo 
proposal for that zone is that um, uh, the the e the EPC areas, uh, which includes the wetland and the strips along Oak Street and and down along Deer Court. Um, are areas that would be conservation blocks to be transferred to the town or the conservation authority so that they could be maintained in natural vegetation or vegetated state um, after development occurs. Um, so that sort of is an overview of what's proposed for this development. Um, of course, the provincial policy statement is involved uh, as the upper policy level. Uh, for development in um, um, in the province, and uh, it states things like uh, encouraging development in developed uh, areas such as um, uh, towns and villages, and, and so on and so forth, which this represents. Um, this is a primary urban settlement. Um, check to make sure that it is primary urban. So I don't misstate that. Yes, primary urban in the, the county official plan. It is um, uh, residential, uh, residential environmental hazard uh, with a significant woodlands overlay on, um, on uh, at least a portion of that property. Um, the current zoning that's in, in place on the property is plan development and EP, the EP being the dark area at the the southern end of the block and then the lighter green um, is the um, plan development. Um, zoning proposed on the property as uh, I've just con gone through on the previous sli uh, slide there so I won't, I won't reiterate that. I'll try to keep things moving along. This was circulated to town staff. Um, and uh, as well as uh, uh, an opportunity for the public to comment. Um, town staff didn't have any particular issues, uh, I don't recall, and uh, the Conservation Authority, of course, was involved because of the wet area and so on, uh, and have provided their comments and concerns about that wet area, which is proposed not to be developed, um, and only the sort of uh, western portion uh, would be developed primarily anyway. Uh, same thing from Canada Post and Union Gas uh, requesting uh, community mailboxes and service easements and so on for uh, gas lines, etc. Uh, so the public comments focus on a number of areas um, in their comments. The last loss of wildlife and of course that's inevitable when you develop in town, in, in towns and villages and so on that, that um, the, the lots and homes developed will uh, displace other kinds of wildlife uh, and so on. Uh, there's increased traffic, although this is a relatively small development and, and uh, I'm not sure that the increase in traffic would be overly noticeable. Um, density, um, oops, sorry. Uh, density, again, uh, I'm not sure whether the thought is that it's too high or too low. Um, but certainly um, the objective here is that it is on, on municipal water and sewers, so you want to get as many lots connecting to the water and sewers as possible to, to make the development more sustainable. On the flip side of that, there may be some thoughts that this is a lower density cottage development and uh, they wish to see um, larger lots and, um, and again, I think the fact that it is fully serviced, uh, it falls into the category where there is at least an expectation that you would develop what you can at 15 units per hectare um, to be consistent with the county plan. Um, enforcement of the EP zoning, um, um, I think that, um, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to address that other than to say that, that the development would proceed um, and safeguards would be put in place with various zones and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the land that isn't to be used for development uh, is being offered up uh, to the municipality or the conservation authority to take uh, and um, 
keep as um, conservation with a conservation easement or something of that nature to maintain those areas in in uh, sort of a natural uh, environment setting uh, in perpetuity. Um, tree removal, uh, when developing at densities of 15 units per hectare or even close to that, it's very difficult to, uh, to uh, uh, maintain trees on the lots and this has this essentially has provided for trees along the fronts of those lots to provide a little bit of visual separation between the street and and the development uh, within um, and um, and maintains a little bit of tree canopy in the area certainly not what was there originally perhaps but but is making a, a valiant attempt I guess um, uh, I don't think that there's been any decision with regard to the naming of Deer Run Court. That's a municipal decision on how they wish to proceed with that as it connects or when it connects to Street A. Um, that decision can be made by the municipality. Um, and um, changing the lot layout to negate the need for the road perhaps ignores the environmental uh, features on the property, including the wetland and so on, where uh, there really isn't uh, a great deal of opportunity to uh, to develop along the roads without um, leaving good development land within the block on the western portion at least um, undeveloped and and uh, in a in an area where development is is uh, favored um, there was a complete application submitted. Uh, there's been circulation to agencies <coughs> and comments are being received from the public regarding the development. Uh, so the public consultation uh, process has started. Uh, this is the first public meeting uh, with regard to the development and um, there won't be any no, uh, there won't be any decision asked for tonight from council. But to recap, <coughs> The proposal is to facilitate a residential plan of subdivision. This meeting is for information purposes and, and to present the application and provide for public engagement and staff will return a subsequent meeting with a recommendation. I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you, Bruce. So any questions from the committee? <coughs> Vice Deputy Mayor Huber. <coughs> Hi, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is really for confirmation and Bruce, I just might um, not understand the way you describe things because you haven't been before us but um, at the beginning you said that this was a proposal to change the zoning to you, you use the expression third density residential I suspect that might have been um, wrong um, but I just uh, maybe I don't understand how, how you, you use um, density language because it, it is our one that we're talking about right because that's what shows up on the map Okay, and it, I, that's okay. I, I just thought maybe you used an expression that I hadn't heard before. Um, and just for clarification, R1 in this particular part of Southampton with our zoning, um, because of the proximity to the shore, R1 um, would preclude the conversion of, of units to include a secondary suite because of the closeness to the shore. Is that correct? I'm not sure. Okay. It, it wouldn't ordinarily be the case, but... It may be. It I think, is. sorry, I think uh, we can probably get that question answered by our J. You're correct. There you <laughs> <laughs> Are you finished today? Okay, I'll start with oh, Councillor Grace. Please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, I also just uh, on the report had a a request um, it's my understanding that our zoning bylaw has been updated um, to to change environmental hazard to environmental to EP and that is inconsistently referred to one of the diagrams is EH and yes I think I think I, it's safe to say that that uh, some of the terminology on on the plan was not correct that it isn't EH it's EP okay um, I also um, couldn't tell from the diagram that we had on our um, um, the digital copy that we received what the average width of the lots is 
It was just unclear. I think it's there, but it was hard to see from the copy. Yes, we had. it certainly is. Um, I. Uh, will be on these plans here. If you give I me think, a moment, I'll. I, I think if it, it just it doesn't say exactly, but it you know at the R1 density it says all all of the lots will have at least a 15 meter frontage. Uh, I'm sorry. 15 I'm... meters. If you see it back okay. in the planning report, all 15. All 15 lots will comply with the minimum standards of 15 meters. Okay. And um, so then my last question refers to the second condition from the SVCA, uh, which is on page 35 of our report. And um, it's um, referring to the tree retention plan. And it says that... Um, the draft plan of subdivision lands and abutting properties during and following construction um, is talking about the report will detail the methods uh, used to avoid impacts to significant natural heritage features. But it's, it uses the term, the language may include a tree retention plan. Does that mean that the re report may include a tree retention plan or does it mean that the final plan of subdivision may. I just wondered why they use the word may as opposed to will. Usually that's used when it hasn't been yet decided. And, and so I, I, I wouldn't want to try to second guess the Conservation Authority on that comment. Um, if, I, if, if you would like to know the frontages of those lots now, I can give them to you. They range, actually, but uh, the lots that are along Shore Road, and, and I'll talk about the, the smallest or the narrowest lots, and perhaps I can back this up a little to, to get uh, lot. get this back. So, so some of the lots... Um, toward the south end, not the, the last lot at the southwest corner, which is sort of a, a triangular lot with the point clipped off, but the next two lots are 16 meter frontage. And then I think just about everything else is, is uh, 18, um, 19, 22, 23. So, so these are not miniature lots by any imagination. Well, most of them are well above the, the minimum. Yes, I, I'm not aware that there has been any determination on a tree re retention plan here, other than what is shown on that map that's up there, where there is tree retention along the new street and along the shore road. Councilor Minaj. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So at the open house, one of the professionals was talking about making sure that the, the trees couldn't be excavated, couldn't, you couldn't get within five feet of the, of the trees that are protected, and that that would be a condition placed on, on those lots and, and that tree retention area. So maybe that can be brought up later. Could I refer to the drawing there and use my pointer and, and ask that, that this lot be changed to R3. And the reason I say that was uh, I brought that up during the, uh, during the open house as well. And the 15 lot, 15 units per, per hectare is not being met by this, by this current uh, proposal, but it would be if we were to allow an R3 zone there and uh, build a multi-unit uh, condominium or a multi-unit row of townhouses. Now, I think it's an appropriate thing to do for the amount of services that are, that are in the area, that we maximize it and we abide by the official plan, the county's official plan. Okay. Deputy Mayor Sherman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Bruce, you, uh, in um, one of your comments, talk, you were talking about the conservation block and actually it was in response to a, a public uh, comment from the public about enforcement of the EP zones. And um, 
I mean, I can appreciate being able to enforce the conservation block. I mean, that part's easy, right? That's, it's there, it's clear. You could, you could, as you suggested, turn it over to the town or turn it over to the conservation authority or have an agreement with the developer. It's the other EP zones, though, that are the difficult ones from my perspective, right? These, this EPB, EP, was it EP, EPA and EPB, uh, you got 1.5, like you're talking about somebody's front yard, right? And you got 1.5 meter strip, little 1.5 meter strip that's zoned one way. And then you got another, I don't know, it's different, I guess. I don't know what the distance, it doesn't say what the width uh, is exactly of EPB. It's called front yards. Um, you know, another strip there that where you can't, you can't cut the trees. It, well, it says, it says it shall not be disturbed. So it could maybe maybe that's a place to start. What does that mean? What, what, what exactly does it mean not to be able to disturb it? Um, well, cutting I think would be disturbing the trees. So that that would be probably the first thing that you could say is prohibited. But um, uh, I wouldn't disagree with your statement that it does become a bit of an enforcement issue. Um, certainly when they're in a conservation easement or something like that, it's, it's somewhat easier to deal with. Um, the, I, and I think about the only thing that um, you have a real assurance of is that the developer will um, um, abide by the zones as they're laid out here um, on, on the map. Um, but but after they're sold, it's a little more difficult to manage. I agree. And, and like when I have every confidence in the developer, and that the developer will do exactly what's written in here, and there'll be some enforcement mechanisms. But 20 years from now, when these zones are still in place, and somebody goes and cuts a tree, um, and their neighbor complains, and they come here, I don't know what town staff does, or if they dig a hole. They dig a hole like a little bit like this. Like it, I think the lands shall not be disturbed. So it seems to me that you could, you could dig a pit in your front yard uh, for whatever reason, and that might be a violation of the of the zoning bylaw, right? So it seems to me that that's. And then, what is the enforcement mechanism on the other side of that to to deal with that? And there's no way. There's nothing. It's not very clear. And I think the last thing that you want to put in place is a bylaw that's unclear and unenforceable because nobody can follow it and nobody can enforce it. Uh, and that just is a problem for everybody for the rest of time, you know, and we're putting this in place going forward, right, Until unless we change it one day. So um, I guess, you know, I recognize that we're at a stage of making comments about this. I guess my comment would be if it comes back like this, I'm going to have trouble supporting it because I just don't see, I don't see how the future plays out very happily for anyone the way it's laid out here. So I think... Um, well, in my opinion, I think it, we need to reassess those EP zones. I, the EPC, I don't have a problem with. EPA and EPB, though, I think um, I think we need to have more discussion internally about whether that's the right thing to do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, any other member of the committee? If not, then I'm going to ask any member from the public or anybody in the chambers this evening who would like to speak to this application. Certainly. I'm still Ron Davidson. Um, with me is uh, Donald Leslie. Donald is the uh, owner of the property and his brother. And beside Donald is his wife. Sitting beside uh, Don on his, the other side is John Morton. John is the wildlife expert. He wrote the environmental impact study and he did the tree retention. Uh, right here is Laura Swanson from Daryl Robbins uh, Engineering Office. Uh, Laura is an engineer and is responsible for all the engineering reports that have been filed with this application. Um, this afternoon, we also had an open house for this uh, this proposal, and there's probably six or eight people here that weren't planners or engineers or politicians. Um, just uh, going through a few things here, uh, the uh, yeah the, the 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 property or the parcel, the larger area on the east side of the property. Um, it will be conveyed to the town if the town is interested in taking it or the conservation authority or some conservation group. Uh, Mr. Leslie and his brother have absolutely no desire to own it, um, so they will be giving that up. Um, the, uh, this application, of course, was, uh, uh, there's again, like the last one, and this is very similar to Brad Pride's proposal in the sense that it's a subdivision uh, in, a, in a forested area. We, too, sat down with the conservation authority in the town and, and the county uh, long before filing the application and 
there was different versions of this uh, this draft plan before we came to this one. Uh, it's it's not a, a perfect subdivision in the sense that it's a, a, a great efficient uh, use of land. As you can see, the road, the new road coming in off of Deer Run, uh, on the east side, you're not hitting any lot until you're well up the road. Um, so it's it's doesn't make it. Um, perfect economically viable subdivision in the world, um, but it's the best we can do. There's really no option in terms of uh, developing these lands other than what you see before you. This application was uh, supported by, again, the environmental impact study, an archaeological assessment, uh, a preliminary stormwater management report, a uh, functional servicing report, and, uh, and a planning report that I prepared. Um, there is mentioning, mention about a tree retention plan and whether or not it needs to be done. It's done. Um, John Morton uh, not only did his environmental impact study, but he did a tree retention plan to the satisfaction of the Conservation Authority, and it's being implemented in exactly what you see up there on the screen. Uh, I'm responsible for the zoning bylaw uh, drawing there, and I apologize for referring it to EH as opposed to EP. They're one in the same. Some municipalities use EP, some use EH, so I apologize for not getting that right. It's an honest mistake. Um, just to be clear, and, uh, and, and I don't know if you understood through Bruce's explanation. You probably did. But the, the purple areas shown on the screen are no touch. Okay. Uh, yes, trees can be removed for proper forest management. If a tree falls down, you can do that. Um, those purple areas on the, on the left side, if you will, or the west side of the property, um, those form part of lots. Those are not being conveyed to the municipality. Uh, there will be no-touch areas, and, and I think that's understood here, but those are no-touch areas that form part of what will turn out to be private lots here. The green strip is, uh, follows the front, front yard setback. Um, the idea is that uh, there's, there's no touch other than you're allowed to put in a driveway because you have to get to the house and you have to run servicing in. So there will be provisions put in that say don't be cutting any trees except a certain wide swath of land and it's right in the bylaw where you can run a, a driveway in and put in your servicing. And then that last little strip that's a meter and a half wide, what that is, and it's, we're starting to get into great detail, but that's how we implement the uh, um, tree preservation plan. In those areas, you can cut the trees. You just can't cut the roots um, because uh, if, if you start digging down uh, in the, into the ground, you cut the tree off, but you start digging down, you're going to start um, wrecking the roots for the trees that you're trying to protect. Okay? I don't know if I just did that any justice, but that's the intent there of the three zones. Um, is, it, uh, is, is it clear what the zoning bylaw um, allows here? It's complicated. Uh, I think it's clear, but it's complicated. Is it enforceable? It's, it's enforceable. Your bylaw, if somebody cuts a tree, and I guess the, your neighbor, the neighbor will come running in and talk to your bylaw enforcement officer, and the bylaw enforcement officer will look up and say, well, I guess you're allowed to cut one tree perhaps because uh, if that's proper forest management, but uh, if you start cutting a whole bunch, then I suppose they're subject to a fine um, because the, the bylaw doesn't allow for it. I don't know how else to do this. Um, we have to implement the, the tree retention plan somehow. Um, and this is what we're putting forward. Um, it's complicated, but it's, 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 it's doable. Um, what else do I have here? Um, that's it, Laura. Is there anything I, I missed here? I apologize, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure if, if everybody heard that. Uh, in your municipality, and rightfully so, you're one of the few municipalities, I think, in Bruce County that require at the building permit stage to actually have an engineer prepare a lot grading plan. Very good idea. Um, so in this particular case, for each individual property, a lot grading plan would be required, and that lot grading plan would have to reflect exactly what's been approved in terms of the, the no-touch areas and the, and the kind of no-touch areas, if you will. That's all I have to say, uh, Mr. Chair, members, of, or Mr. Uh, Thank Mayor, you. And members of Council. Thank you. You had a question? Of, okay, go ahead. Put you on the hot seat, then, Ron, because yeah. I, I, I kind of intimated that that you you had 
no issues with a potential request to change that R1 to an R3. Okay, so yeah, thanks, I forgot to mention that. So just a very quick background there. Um, I indicated to Councillor Minaj this afternoon in my little presentation that uh, the density represents what we're proposing here, 12.8 units per, per gross hectare. The county official plan states that it should be 15 hectares, but it does allow for a slightly reduced density if it can be justified. I'm suggesting it is justified that we go with 12.8 as opposed to 15. Here's why. What I had said this afternoon was um, at one time we were looking at putting a triplex in the corner on, on that property. And that's something that Laura and I were fiddling with just trying to get our numbers up. So we hit the 15 units per gross hectare. We can't make these, let's back up, we can't make the lots any smaller. So we can't squeeze more lots on the here to use that term, and I hate using that term. But so that's why some of the lots are a little bit bigger. Um, we can't we can't sh uh, re reduce the lot frontages and therefore come up with more lots. But what we could possibly do is take one of the lots, the big one, and uh, and cr and uh, add some more units to it. So make it a triplex. Um, Mr. Leslie really doesn't want to do that. And when I had a discussion with the county planning department during pre-consultation, uh, we both uh, reminisced about Michael McMillan's application. There'll be two or three council members in this room that sat on the planning committee. And my marching orders that night, and I paraphrase here, were come back, remove all the townhouses from your development proposal and come back with single family in this part of Southampton because it doesn't meet the character of the neighborhood. And I apologize if I put any words in anybody's mouth uh, that were part of that planning committee, but I think I nailed that one right on with my description. So um, in, in, with that fresh in mind, we thought it was a bad idea to try to put a, a triplex in the corner there. We know how that would be received at a public meeting, and I'm not afraid of standing up here and justifying it. I just don't think it's worth going through that, that exercise of knowing the end result is the neighbors don't want a triplex there. I'm making the assumption that now the planning committee or council probably wouldn't support that anyway. And I'm saying that I can justify 12.8 units per gross hectare as opposed to 15. And I respectfully request that we just go ahead with the R1 zone and not an R3 in that corner. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public would like to speak to this application? Welcome. Good evening, Mayor Smith, members of council. <laughs> I'm uh, Brian Cleaver. Uh, my wife, Nancy, and I, we own a property, Kitty Corner, to the proposed development. We're within the boundary of being notified of public meetings, and that's why we're here this evening, along with other members of the neighborhood. Um, I would like to start possibly with uh, Councillor Menage's uh, proposal. The R1 on the diagram above, on the top right-hand corner. I would think, looking at the no-build EH3, uh, EHC designation, that that may in fact not be able to be built upon. It would appear to me that 25%, at least 20% of that lot, proposed lot, is in fact designated that EHC and therefore on behalf of the neighbors we respectfully request that that be removed from the proposal. It has been mentioned by uh, Deputy Mayor Charbonneau, EHB, the green portion on your maps, has no width to it at the moment. I don't know if anybody from the uh, technical Staff, can you give us a width on that? Four point five meters. The uh, term increased in traffic. Um, the thought that it may not, in fact, be an increase uh, that would be recognisable. Um, I'd like to uh, disagree with that comment. It was an opinion, and my opinion, and the opinion of the neighbors is that the uh, 15 proposed lots, hopefully 14 approved, will have approximately 25 to 35 vehicles. 
Not unusual for individuals in this neighborhood to have two vehicles to get back into town, especially in the winter months. By putting an extra 30 vehicles on those roads, we believe that the traffic flow will be drastically impacted in a negative manner. And we would like that comment put down and recorded, please. The road, the uh, paved portion of the road in that area is 18 feet wide. With the concrete curbs either side, it goes to 21 feet, six inches. That is the width that we're talking about. They are not the width of the road that you see on the shore road from Port Elgin to Southampton. That is not the same width of the roads you're looking at now. I, I have a question now, Mr. Mayor, because uh, I'm not up on these things anymore. EHC, does the municipality of Sorghi Insurers normally take the responsibility and ownership of property designated EHC and maintain them? Uh, I think I can answer, I can answer that. We don't, uh, we don't do it very often, but there, there is the occasion that parts of the property will be deeded to the municipality. And, and the EHC, I mean, it could be any designation. Those, those letters don't mean anything. It would just be to say that the, this, this piece of property, that somebody was going to, to uh, deed it to the town for whatever reason, but it does happen. Uh, I don't know, maybe any staff want to speak to that? Do you want to speak to that at all, Jay? It, 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 it depends it, on the nature of the application. Yeah. We, I mean, uh, staff will put a recommendation to council on something. Okay. Uh, yes, does that get, okay. The, the uh, thought process behind that, uh, living in the area, we know the land, we, we know, we have a reasonable idea of the wildlife and the habitat of that property. And we're not quite sure yet because we haven't gone through the document provided by the environmental uh, assessment process. We haven't gone through that in detail, but we will at the next public meeting come forward. Um, we believe that under no circumstances should the town municipality of Sorgin Shores enter into any agreement that gives them the responsibility of any of that EHC. In fact, we're proposing that the present owner of the property keep it and puts in place a certain amount of funds in an account that can be drawn upon to maintain that to the standards required by the municipality. The width of the driveways that will be allowed to go through the um, EHB is 30% of the width of the lot. As we've heard, the uh, lots, um, I believe the smallest lot is 15 meters, 16. So that would be a 4.8 driveway. So the premise is that that taken out of that property will reflect upon the damage that can be done in the prevention of damage to the trees, quite a large amount in that area. We're also having difficulty as citizens of this municipality actually finding out where the EHC is, where the EHB is, let alone the EHA, which is only 1.5 meters wide. And we would welcome any members of staff or council to arrange with us to come out to the area and physically point that out on the ground to us. Because without actually knowing fundamentally where these lines are, we cannot adequately display our <coughs> pleasure with the plan or our displeasure with the plan. We know that the road allowance is marked there is 66 feet, but we also know that the road is no more than 22 feet. So the other 40 odd feet has got to be somewhere, 
And outside of that 40 feet, we then get into the EHA, the EHB, let alone the EHC. So before we can adequately comment on some of the uh, proposals that are forward to this uh, meeting this evening, the pub open meeting, we would like to have more in-depth uh, information so that we can come to the next open house and uh, provide you with a better update, Mayor Smith. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Make sure you sign the sheet, Ryan. And, and I think as this information, we're really gathering information here tonight, and when we find, get close to the final design, I think we can make that information available to you is keep in contact with either our clerk or our planning department here. Okay, thank you. Okay. Is there anyone else from the public would like to speak to this? Or Anyone else? Did you, just, just hang on. If you can just come up and state your name so everybody knows, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> And ensure you sign the shining sheet. I sure. Did that. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. My name is Linda. I live on Oak Street. Um, I just wondered if maybe it's too early at this point, but I just wondered how large the dwellings were allowed to be. Like, what percentage of the lot are they allowed to take? Our one, I think our total coverage is 35%, isn't that correct? I'm guessing. We, we'd have to get that 40%? Would be, would be, would be 40%. And then there will be front yard setbacks and side yard setbacks. Those, that information is available in our zoning bylaw. I mean, it's a big document. If you want, we can, we can just give our, our, our planner, uh, Jay Posner, a call, and he can clarify that for you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Here, I think he's nice. He's got it on the top of his head. Any, any, is there any other member of the public who would like to speak to this application? If not, then I, I, I just to remind you again before, if you want information about how this process is and be part of it, please sign the, the uh, sign-in sheet. And Councillor agrees. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wondered if I could ask a follow-up question from something that came up uh, as a result of Mr. Cleaver's presentation. Um, and that is, um, is, is it too early to know, I guess Mr. Davidson might be able to answer this, uh, what the proposed width of the road within the subdivision would be? Can I ask why? Yeah, yeah, I do. I know. I, I think I, I, well, I just don't see the reason for it to be that wide within, especially within a, a small subdivision. I'm, I mean, there's a lot of evidence that shows that wider lanes leads to increased speed. And with the residents' concern about increased traffic, I, I have an issue with that. Okay, if there is no other person who would like to speak to this, we'll move on to the next application. I thank everyone for coming out this evening for this one. So we'll go back to our agenda, which is the next item then is a zoning bylaw amendment Z-61-17.48, care of 153314 Ontario Incorporated, care of Cedar Court Motel. So I go back again, uh, just so we've got the council chambers. So it's zoning bylaw amendment Z-61-17.48, 153 Ontario Incorporated in care of Cedar Court Motel, and it's 243 Huron Street South. And again, I'll turn it over to our planner, Mr. Stickney. 
Okay, uh, I should begin, I think, probably by uh, letting you know that I quoted from your old OP in my report, discovered it after the report was submitted to you, and, and so I now understand a bit more fully uh, what's going on on that piece of property because it was pretty odd what I was looking at before. Um, okay, so... The proposal here is to facilitate the conversion of the existing motel into apartment dwelling units. Uh, so there's an existing motel building on the property. Uh, it will remain essentially as it is with, with interior renovations and so on to facilitate apartments rather than uh, overnight rental uh, motel uh, type suites or, or rooms. Um, this would... Uh, um, um, require a rezoning from residential first density, which appears to be on the property now uh, in a special provision nine um, to residential third density um, with a special provision to provide an apartment rather than a motel. Um, so that, that sort of takes care of, of one of the major errors that I, I made when I was looking at the policies on the property. There's an aerial view of the property and the L-shaped building in the center of that uh, uh, aerial photograph is the uh, motel. Uh, there's parking um, on the street side of the motel building there that you can see and then uh, development around it. Um, and primarily, uh, so the motel was a commercial use and primarily what's around it there our uh, residential uses. Uh, this property is serviced by municipal water and, and um, uh, it says private septic. Is that, can that be true? I don't think so. <laughs> no. Um, um, and uh, it's uh, located on Huron Street South in um, uh, Southampton. Um, there's a sketch of the property and a picture at the top of the page of the existing motel building. Uh, it's a two-story uh, motel structure uh, with rooms on both floors. Um, there is a shed on the uh, what would be the left-hand end of the building looking at the picture at the top of the page or in the um, site plan uh, shown there. Um, which is a utility building of some sort. Um, and uh, the various other details are given there. Essentially, uh, this is an existing building, so they're, they're really, we're looking at existing setbacks and so on and so forth, and the, the parking area at the front of the building. Um, PPS is uh, the policy, the overarching policy uh, document. Uh, again, it's in the um, um, primary urban settlement uh, in the Bruce County official plan uh, is in, and um, this is where I got off the rails when I was writing my report, it is in the um, uh, residential special policy area 2. Uh, and I quoted from, from the old bylaw, uh, sorry, uh, from the old uh, OP, uh, which was um, quite different from what it is today. So, so what, what this um, um, uh, special policy to essentially um, allows it or, or uh, provides policy for is that it recognizes this neighborhood as being an established low-density, low-rise neighborhood reduced, uh, where reduced height requirements um, uh, should be used to ensure compatibility with the built form of the existing community. So it recognizes that this is, is a well-established neighborhood. This building happens to be in the neighborhood. It's a two-story building, so it um, isn't necessarily out of place. It, it has been in place for some time, um, and, um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, Zoning on the property currently is R1, um, and on this particular property, it's got um, uh, special provision nine, uh, 
uh, that allows for the motel. That would change to an R3 zone uh, to, uh, to allow for the redevelopment to an apartment building. The application was circulated to town staff um, and uh, there was mention of development charges uh, uh, that may, may apply to the uh, proposed development um, and, uh, and it may be subject to site plan control. As the majority of the development or redevelopment of the building is inside the building, the site plan control issues are, are probably related more to the parking area and so on uh, around the building and what they may want to achieve there um, for um, uh, the property. Um, Conservation Authority, First Nations and so on were uh, circulated and there were no concerns raised uh, from those agencies. Um, a few, a few uh, comment letters, emails and so on were received and uh, they primarily related to property maintenance, privacy and, and the tenure of the building. Um, and um, I guess from my perspective, I, I'm not sure that moving from motel to, to apartments is a, is a downgrading of tenure in the building. It seems to me that it would be better to have long-term residents in, in the rooms rather than motel use, but certainly there are motels that rent for longer stays and so on, so I, I don't know uh, the nature of the former develop, uh, development that was there or the motel use uh, as it would compare to the apartments, but certainly the apartments would maintain a residential use of the building um, and, uh, and would be longer stay accommodations for people um, in the area and would provide um, a mix, a little bit more of a mix of, of housing types and, and tenures that uh, are provided in the area. Um, the application uh, was uh, complete. Um, we've done our circulation to agencies and uh, we are now beginning to involve the public in consultation related to the redevelopment of the property. Uh, this is the first public meeting to be held with regard to the development on redevelopment of that building and property. Uh, there'll be no notice uh, asked for from council tonight. It's an information session. Um, and um, it would involve the rezoning of the property to allow for the apartment dwelling use on the land. Uh, and staff will return with at a subsequent meeting with a recommendation uh, on how to move forward. And um, Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Bruce. Any questions of <coughs> Vice Deputy or Hubert? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Do you have any awareness um, of how many units they're talking about in mm -hmm. the conversion? Um, it certainly is a, a building that is definitely in need of, of some TLC and, and some upgrading. And, and certainly, you know, it's. It, I don't believe has the capacity to, to there's either going to be uh, a few smaller units or a very few number of larger units. So I'm just curious what, what they're talking about. I'd also um, just like to express that there's basically four motel type structures in Southampton. This would be one of them. And then you've got Huron Haven, the Manor Motel, and then um, north of the river, uh, the new one. Um, this one um, actually, uh, you know, probably, I don't know their exact business situation, but, you know, certainly it is, it does have people stay there. It's very popular year-round, summer, and then in the winter for tournaments and things like that. Um, perhaps important, um, and, and certainly I think this is, um, for Marie and Tom, is, is the next step in their, their development of their property. Um, and it, it sort of makes sense to me in a way. I'm just, again, curious how many units, but... Um, we're going to have um, some interesting issues going forward. There really are less and less temporary accommodation options here, and on the tourism front, that's, that's maybe something to just keep in mind. So did they give you an indication of how many units they were referred to? Uh, not exactly, but, but the, the uh, proposal is to change the uh, motel rooms essentially to three to... 300 to 500 square foot apartments 
And my understanding was that some of them will be two-story units and some will be single-story units on the upper and lower floors. So there'll be a mixture of different types of units um, and different, somewhat different sizes up to about 500 square feet. Um, the total that they're going to yield from that, I'm not exactly sure. I don't have a number. Councilor Minaj. I think we just found the reference to 11 units. My understanding is this would be similar to a conversion that took place in the urban center Port Elgin as well recently that we approved. So can we just, just a confirmation that the expectation is that site plan control would be applied to this, this change? Yeah, that's been recommended certainly and there's no reason why it shouldn't be. Uh, but, but to reiterate, most of the redevelopment will be within the existing dwellings or in the uh, building. Uh, I, that statement worries me. <laughs> I just would like to know that, that, that the project is going to be under site plan control. I believe it is, yes. Any further questions? Thank you very much, Bruce. So I guess we are at the end of our agenda. And I'll take a motion to adjourn. Councillor Madison and Deputy Mayor Charbonneau. All in favor? We're adjourned. <laughs>